Hello, and welcome to Living Hope Church Online, brought to you by Living Hope Church Broadcast Media. I am your host, Pastor Dr. Kemi Hatanda Ilori, the General Overseer of Living Hope Church. Today, Tuesday, the 14th of March, 2023, I am grateful to God that we have another opportunity to encourage one another from the Bible. Actually, today, I will be starting a new series on selfless love. Selfless love. This is the first installment. This is part one in this series. This first part is titled Emotional Manipulation and Emotional Attachment. Emotional Manipulation and Emotional Attachment. Our key scripture will be found in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verses 4 to 8. Love suffers long and is kind. Love does not envy. Love does not parade itself, is not puffed up, does not behave rudely, does not seek its own, is not provoked, thinks no evil, does not rejoice in iniquity, but rejoices in the truth, bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things, love never fails. Very clearly, the kind of love that the Bible is describing here is selfless love. There is no other religion that we will find such a wonderful definition of selfless love. It is only in Christianity that we truly understand what it means to have selfless love. And the reason is clear. It is only in Christianity that you have a savior, actually the savior of the world, the son of God, the Lord Jesus Christ, who came down from heaven, lived a sinless life, an entirely blameless life, and died on the cross for the sins of the world. So much so that the Lord Jesus teaches us in John chapter 3, verse 16, that God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever will place their faith in him, whosoever will believe in him, will not perish, but have everlasting life. That event of crucifixion, resurrection, and the ascension of Jesus Christ to God marks the entirety of the definition of selfless love. Jesus, the sinless person, died for the sinful. He died for us completely, each one of us individually. So anytime we are talking about sinless love, don't look further than how God demonstrates his love by giving us his son, the Lord Jesus Christ, and how the Lord Jesus lived a sinless life and died for us on the cross. It's important for us to know that that love it's possible for us to have that love only when we are in Christ, when we are born again by the Spirit of God. Because the Spirit of God will pour the love of God into our heart. We will begin to love God exclusively. And also, we will begin to love people selflessly. 
by the grace of God, we've already spoken about what it means to love God exclusively. Now, in the series that we are starting today, we'll be talking about what it means to love one another selflessly. In today's broadcast, I want to look at how we can think we are practicing selfless love when we are merely responding to emotional manipulation and emotional attachment. So, let's dive in. Anytime we are talking about selfless love, we need to realize that often we think we are practicing selfless love when we are merely responding to emotional manipulation and emotional attachment. For instance, for me personally, it took me several years to realize that responding to emotional manipulation and emotional attachment is not selfless love. You might want to ask, what is emotional manipulation? You see, when people know that you are kind, you are compassionate, you are generous, they will tell you stories to make you feel you should help them by all means. They are playing on your psychology. They are playing with your emotions. What you will discover when people are playing on your psychology, when they are playing on your emotions, is that such people will be dishonest about their problems or they will be exaggerating their problems to make you feel guilty if you refuse to help them. For several years, I did not know that emotional ma manipulation was very, very common. Actually, emotional manipulation is very, very common. And people that are kind are usually the victims. For instance, in relationships where we are parents to people, either biological or spiritual, and we are kind and generous and compassionate, guess what? We are likely to be victims of emotional manipulation. Parents can practice emotional manipulation on their children. Children can practice emotional manipulation on their parents. Church leaders can practice emotional manipulation on their church members. And church members can practice emotional manipulation on their church leaders. Our relatives can practice emotional manipulation on us and we can practice emotional manipulation on them. Our friends, our colleagues at work, anybody can practice emotional manipulation on us. Anybody, it is very, very common. Once you are kind and compassionate and generous, it is often possible for people to exploit your kindness, to exploit your generosity, to exploit your compassion by telling you stories that they know will appeal to your emotion and make you feel guilty if you don't help them. By telling you stories of their lives in a way that will provoke your emotion to want to help them. That is what we mean as emotional manipulation. But it's not just emotional manipulation 
that we can confuse with selfless love. Emotional attachment is another common trick that people employ to motivate us to help them. Emotional attachment is another common trick that people employ to motivate us to help them. So what is emotional attachment? Emotional attachment occurs when people make every effort to be close to us, when they tell us that they love us, but actually they only love us for their own agenda. They love us purely for their own welfare and not ours. They love us for what they believe they will gain from us, not what they truly believe they could help us to achieve in life. They have a selfish agenda. They will attach themselves to us because they see us as a potential solution to their problems. And they will do whatever it takes for them to emotionally bring us to that place of responsibility for helping them. Emotional attachment is also very, very common. Unless we are very discerning, we may not recognize it, and we may think by responding to emotional attachment, we may think we are practicing selfless love. That is not true. We are not practicing selfless love. We are only helping selfish people. We are only helping selfish people. What we need to know, especially if we are kind and generous, is that we must be careful that we do not love people in a way that promotes emotional manipulation and emotional attachment. When we love people, in a way that promotes emotional manipulation and emotional attachment. Our love is not actually selfless love. Our love is not approved in the sight of God. If you look at 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verses 1 to 8 that we have read, and you begin to think about the description of selfless love. When we put into practice what 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verses 1 to 8 is saying to us, guess what? We will not fall victim to emotional manipulation and emotional attachment. I want to show us five attitudes that can promote emotional manipulation and emotional attachment, that can make us to be responding merely to emotional manipulation and emotional attachment, and be thinking that we are actually practicing selfless love when we are not. The first kind of attitude is when we are constantly acting like a Messiah to people. They will put us on a pedestal. They will think we are their Messiah because of the way we are behaving, because of what we are saying, because of how we carry ourselves at home, at work, Everywhere we go, we give a perception that we are people's Messiah. And when we do that, guess what? People will flock to us. Whenever they have a problem, they won't go to God first. They will come to us 
for every problem that they have. They won't attempt to solve their own problem first. They will carry their problem and bring their problem to us to solve for them. Because they have this perception that by the way we talk, by the way we behave, we are presenting ourselves as a Messiah to them, as a person that must solve all their problems. So I really want to encourage each one of us. Listen carefully. It is not selfless love when you are carrying yourself around like a Messiah to everybody. It is not selfless love. It took me some time to realize that this was the kind of perception that I was giving to people. I'm not surprised. Let me give you an example of a servant of God in the Bible who gave this perception to people and it became a problem for him eventually. You won't guess who that servant of God is. It is Moses. It is Moses. When Moses was growing up, he came to an understanding that God was going to use him as a deliverer for the people of Israel in Egypt. At that time, the people of Israel in Egypt were called Hebrews. So as Moses discovered that God was going to use him as a deliverer, for Hebrew people or Jewish people or the children of Israel in Egypt. His understanding of that role was not mature. Come with me to Exodus chapter 2, verses 11 to 15. Exodus chapter 2, verses 11 to 15. There you find a story that Moses was passing across the land and he found a Hebrew and an Egyptian quarreling. And Moses took it upon himself to intervene and he killed the Egyptian and buried him in the sand. And he told the Hebrew person, now you can go. Most of us, when we have a very immature understanding of the role that God wants us to play in the lives of people, we can step into that kind of wrong attitude. So Moses killed the Egyptian and let the Hebrew person go. He had created a problem for himself. The second day, he found two Hebrew men fighting and he tried to intervene. And one of them said to him, do you want to kill me like you killed the Egyptian yesterday? As soon as Moses heard that, he knew that Pharaoh would know that he, the prince of Egypt, he had been raised up as an Egyptian not as a Hebrew boy. Now the Pharaoh would know that Moses had been rebellious against the state of Egypt by killing an Egyptian because he favored his own Hebrew people. So Moses ran away. You see, God is so gracious, so loving, so kind. Moses ran away into exile, and God left him there for 40 years. Sometimes, when we misunderstand our role in the life of people, we create a problem for ourselves that God will just say, okay, manage that problem yourself. Let's see how you will escape. I'm praying for each one of us today 
please understand the role that God has given you in your family. Understand the role that God has given you at work. Understand the role that God has given you in the church. Understand the role that God has given you in your community. You are not anybody's Messiah. Make it clear that you are a human being. You can help as best as you can, but you are not anybody's Messiah. It took me several years, but I'm grateful to God. I now know the difference between the role that God wants me to play in people's life and the role that I am playing. Now I emphasize the role that God wants me to play in people's life. I make sure that I, it's very clear to people that I am not their Messiah, that they should first take their problems to God. Not only that, they should try and solve their own problems. They shouldn't come to me at all. Well, may God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, help us to communicate to people rightly. See, when Moses went into exile, God left him there for 40 years. And then God went back to him. But Moses had not really learned that problem that he was carrying. He had not really learned the lesson. 40 years, yet he had not learned the lesson. How do we know? Okay, come with me to Exodus chapter 17, verses 3 to 6. And the people thirsted there for water, and the people complained against Moses and said, Why is it you have brought us up out of Egypt to kill us and our children and our livestock with thirst? So Moses cried out to the Lord, saying, What shall I do with these people? They are almost ready to stone me. What Moses should have done to these people is tell them, go and pray to God. I did not bring you out of Egypt. It was God. <laughs> I am not your Messiah. It was God who brought you out of Egypt. Learn to pray to God. Learn to ask God to help you. But they came to Moses and he ran to God. Sometimes, Maybe in your family, maybe in the church, maybe at work, maybe anywhere you are, you have given the impression that people should run to you and then you will take their problem to God instead of helping them to anchor their faith upon God, to go to God themselves. So God told Moses what to do. God said, go with the rod that I have approved for you, the staff that you carry, that you used to part the Red Sea. Go to Horeb. I will stand there before you. And when you get to, to Horeb, strike the rock and water will come out of it that the people may drink. And Moses did so in the sight of the elders of Israel. Now, I want to ask you a question. When the children of Israel, when they have problem again, what do you think they will do? Your guess is as good as mine. They will run to Moses. See in Numbers chapter 20, verses 7 to 12. They ran to Moses again, they were thirsty. And Moses ran to, ran to God. Then the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Take the rod, you and your brother Aaron, gather the congregation together, speak to the rock before their eyes, and it will yield its water. Thus you shall bring water for them out of the rock, and give drink to the congregation and their animals. So Moses took the rod from before the Lord, as God commanded him, 
And Moses and Aaron gathered the assembly together before the same rock. And he said to them, Hear now, you rebels, must we bring water for you out of this rock? Then Moses lifted his hand and struck the rock twice with his rod, and water came out abundantly, and the congregation and their animals drank. They clapped for Moses. They said, what a man of God, what a servant of God. But Moses had done something extremely wrong. I really want to help someone here. Stop giving people the idea that you are their Messiah. You are not anybody's Messiah. You are not your parents' Messiah. You are not your mother's Messiah. You are not your father's Messiah. You are not your children's Messiah. You are not the Messiah of your church. You are not the Messiah of your colleagues at work. Stop giving anyone the wrong impression that as soon as they come to you, their problem is solved. Let everybody know that you are a human being and direct them to God first. Yes, people can still come and ask for help because they know your skills, they know your talents, they know your kindness, they know your generosity, they know your compassion. But when they come, ask them, have you taken this problem to God first? What did God tell you? And if they said, yes, we've taken the problem to God, then say, well, I've got two things for you, first and foremost, advice, and secondly, prayer. Don't just do something out of emotional attachment, out of emotional manipulation. Give them advice to help them. Then pray with them. Let them know that they have to anchor their faith upon God, that you are not their Messiah. Don't let anybody think that you are responsible for assisting them, that they are entitled to come to you, that if you don't do it, you are guilty. If you don't do it, they are offended. You will just be responding to emotional attachment and emotional manipulation. That used to happen to me frequently until God in his mercy opened my eyes, opened my heart to let me know that I was giving the wrong perception to people. They were thinking I was their Messiah and that they were entitled to be saved. They were entitled to be assisted by their Messiah. May God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit help each one of us. See, Exodus chapter 32, verses 31 to 34. You know when Moses did that wrong thing by striking the rock twice, instead of speaking to the rock, God told him, because of what you have done, because you have responded to emotional manipulation, you have responded to emotional attachment, you have given this impression, this perception that you are people's Messiah, you won't enter the promised land. For that reason alone, Moses did not enter the promised land. I hope somebody can get it now. Because of emotional attachment, he went into exile for 40 years. Learn something today. Don't create a problem for yourself in your relationship with God. He went into exile for 40 years. Despite that, he didn't learn his lesson. In the wilderness, he lost the favor to enter into the promised land because he did not learn. The difference between responding to emotional manipulation, 
emotional attachment, and selfless love. I want to show you how bad it can be when we don't understand the difference. Exodus chapter 32, verses 31 to 34. In this story, the children of Israel, instead of worshiping God, they molded a gold calf. Aaron, the brother of Moses, collected their earrings and molded a calf and said to the people of Israel, whilst Moses was away, this gold calf is the God who delivered you from Egypt. So they rose up and they began to worship the gold calf as their God, saying that this gold calf was the God that brought them out of Egypt. Can you see the problem that people would have if you don't anchor their faith concretely upon the true Messiah, the true God? Even Aaron, who had the opportunity to tell these people, it was God who brought you out of Egypt. Moses was just God's handmaid. It wasn't Moses that was your Messiah. So when they came to Aaron to complain about this Moses, we don't know what has happened to him. Let's choose another leader. It should have been the opportunity for Aaron to set things in order for them. But you see what this servant of God did. He was emotionally manipulated. Not only that, he was responding to emotional attachment. So he built a gold calf. Of course, God was very unhappy with the children of Israel. So Moses came down from the mountain. He found the people who were worshiping the gold calf. He was so angry. He broke the two tablets of the Ten Commandments. He called the children of Israel together. He rebuked them. Then he went back to God. And this is where I want you to learn a lesson. Then Moses returned to the Lord in Exodus chapter 32, verses 31 to 34. Moses returned to the Lord and said, Oh, these people have committed a great sin. They have made for themselves a God of gold. Yet now, if you will, forgive their sin. But if not, I pray, blot me out of your book, which you have written. Wow. <laughs> Why would you say that, Moses? Why would you be commanding God like that? If you will, forgive them. But if you will not forgive them, then blot me out of your book, which you have written. Why? Can you see the problem we can have? when we misunderstand and we mischaracterize the responsibility that God has given us in the life of people, when we have a Messiah complex, when we think we are now their Messiah, can you see the problem we will have? That's what Moses told God. And the Lord said to Moses, very graciously, whoever has sinned against me, I will blot him out of my book. Thank God for his grace towards us. He is so very understanding. What an awesome father we have. But for God, all the mistakes I made, responding to emotional attachment and emotional manipulation, could have ruined me completely all the time that I spent, all the money that I spent, wasted, wasted, completely wasted. You need to come to a place where you have to understand that responding to emotional manipulation and emotional attachment is not selfless love. 
You need to come to a place where you look at your own attitude because your behavior, your conduct, what you say, how you say things might be promoting you as a messiah to people. They might have the wrong perception that God has raised you up to solve their problems and that they are entitled to be helped by you. And if you don't help them, they feel offended. They think you are neglecting your responsibility as a Messiah. They no longer see God as their Messiah. They no longer want to solve their own problems again. They are coming to you frequently. Maybe it's your sister. Maybe it's your brother. Maybe it's your mother. Maybe it's your father. Maybe it's your colleague at work. And you know how emotionally draining that can be. But guess what? On that false assumption that you are doing what is right in the sight of God, you will think, oh, I'm doing the right thing. I'm being sacrificial. No, you are not. You are merely responding to emotional manipulation and emotional attachment. And that is not selfless love. Come with me to the second attitude that can promote emotional manipulation and emotional attachment. When for every problem that people bring, you give them money, you throw money at their problem. You are giving money to everyone that comes for help. The message will spread to others. Go to him, he will give you money. Go to him, he will give you money. He's very kind, he's very generous, he's very compassionate. Go and tell him the story of your life. Make sure you tell it in a way that will make him feel emotionally attached to your story so he can help you. He will give you money. People will come to you from left, right, and center, even from your back. And you will soon discover that everybody is coming for one reason only, to get money from you. All their problems can only be solved by getting money from you. It took me several years before I understood that I had created problem for myself. Money is not everything. Money is not everything. Do you know on many occasions, I even borrowed money in order to help people. I didn't have the money, I went and borrowed. I thought I was being sacrificial. I thought I was being selfless. No, that is not the way to show selfless love. Not at all. Go and read 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verses 1 to 8 again. May God open your heart. May God open your eyes. Giving money to people is creating a problem for you. May you never be like me, that you come to a place where you are even borrowing money, getting into debt more and more. Borrowing money to help people is not selfless love. It is financial ruin. You are ruining yourself financially. And God is not to blame for your debt. God is not to blame for your poverty. Listen very carefully. Money is not everything. Don't give money to people. Let them know that when they come and tell you their story, you say, okay, what have you done to help yourself? Okay, let me pray for you. Okay, let me give you some advice. I want to tell you something. People from whom you get into financial debt in order to help them may not even know. Let me explain it again. People for whom 
you get into financial debt in order to help them may not even know. They may even use the money that you borrowed wastefully. When people get money from you cheaply, they often don't value it. When people get money from you cheaply, they often don't value it. Come and ask me. May God open your eyes. Throwing money at every problem that people bring to you is a great mistake. It only promotes emotional manipulation and emotional attachment. Money is not everything. People need advice. They need counseling. They need prayers. Much more than they need your money. Because when people know that we always throw money at their problems, they will always keep coming for money and more money. In that way, we would have created a big problem for ourselves. People will treat us purely as their money bags and nothing more. Don't think that they love you. They might call you all sorts of emotional names. My daddy, my mother, my helper, my whatever, my pastor. When they know that you are always throwing money at their problems, they will keep coming because you've become their money bag. People will treat you purely as their money bag and nothing more. And they will be willing to tell you any story just to get that money from you. They will even make you feel, feel guilty if you fail to give them money. They will make you even feel guilty if you fail to give them money. In Acts chapter 3, verses 1 to 8, you meet Peter and John on their way to the temple to pray. A beggar was there expecting them to give him money. Peter said, neither gold nor silver do we have, but in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, arise. You must come to a place where you can tell people, I don't have money to give you. Don't feel ashamed to say it. Money is not everything. If somebody is coming to you for money, you should be able to say, I don't have money to give you, particularly if you don't have. Think about it. Is it not interesting that Jesus never gave anyone money? Jesus performed many miracles, but he never ever performed a miracle giving money to the poor. I really want to help someone here. Selfless love often does not involve giving money to people. Think twice before you give money to people. Jesus didn't give money to the poor. Yet we all know that Jesus truly deeply loved and cared for the poor. Please, don't let anyone treat you as their money bag. Don't let anyone treat you as their money bag. Not even God is anyone's money bag. I know time is far gone and we have only covered two out of five attitudes. I want to cover the remaining three as quickly as possible. Another kind of attitude that can promote emotional manipulation and emotional atta attachment in people around you is when you let them think that you've become their doormat. When you have become their doormat. What's a doormat? A doormat is a small rug placed just inside a doorway where people can wipe their dirty shoes before entering the house. When you are presenting yourself as a doormat, what it means is that 
Everybody will come to wipe their problems on you. Everybody. From the north, from the south, from the east, from the west, everyone, people who know you, people who don't know you, they will come to wipe their problems on you. You'll become a doormat in people's life. Being a doormat is weakness, not strength. You give people the expectation that you are willing to kill yourself in order to help them. You give them the perspective. You give them the perception. You give them the feeling that you are willing to kill yourself in order to help them. Therefore, they will always come to you and take advantage of you. May God in his mercy help each one of us to understand that selfless love is not when we are responding to emotional manipulation and emotional attachment. Selfless love is not when we are promoting emotional manipulation and emotional attachment. We are just creating problems for ourselves. See, in 2 Thessalonians, Chapter 3, verses 10 to 12. Paul the Apostle was writing. He said, let everybody walk in quietness and eat their own bread. If anyone will not walk, neither shall he eat. How many times have you given that kind of advice to people who have come to you? In Galatians chapter 6, verses 4 to 5. Paul the Apostle says, let everyone examine their own word. Everyone should bear their own load. How many times have you given that advice to people? That examine your own work. You should be able to bear your own load. Why do you think you must wipe your problems on me? Why? Some people will say, oh, we are praying for you, that God will bless you so you can bless us. That is emotional manipulation. That is emotional attachment. Tell them, don't pray for me, pray for yourself, that God will bless you, that you don't have to come to me for help. Don't pray for me, that God will bless me so that I can help you. Pray for yourself, that God will bless you so that you don't need to come and wipe your problems on me. May God the Father, God the Son, help us. So you see it in Galatians chapter 6, verses 4 to 5. Let everyone examine their own work. Let everybody bear their own burden. Don't become a doormat to people. Attitude number four, very quickly. You know, sometimes we don't realize that God doesn't want us to help everyone. Listen again. God doesn't want us to help everyone. Even God does not help everyone. But you see, we have this wrong attitude that everyone that comes to us, we must help. And we create a perception that is very wrong. So guess what? Wrong people will also come for help. Helping the wrong people is always a problem. It's not a sign of selfless love. Listen, there will always be people that it will be a mistake for you to help. Open your eyes wide. Open your heart wide. Don't think you must help everyone. Be bold enough to be able to say no to certain people. Don't be selfless for someone who is selfish. Someone who is selfish does not need your help. Give them advice. Tell them they need to be selfless and God will help them. Don't think you are practicing selfless love when you are helping someone who is selfish. 
don't be selfless for someone who is lazy. Someone who is lazy. Don't think you are practicing self selfless love by helping someone who is lazy. Tell them to go and look for work. Work with their own hands. Get up and do something. Don't be selfless for someone who is wasteful. There are people you mustn't help. But if you give the impression that anyone that comes to you, you will help, you have failed. You are not practicing selfless love. You are just responding to emotional manipulation and emotional attachment. Don't practice selfless love towards someone who is wasteful. You will know it. Maybe you've helped them in the past with money and they're coming back. I'm telling you, it took me some years before I could come to an understanding that I wasn't practicing selfless love. I was just the target of people who are practicing emotional manipulation and emotional attachment on me. Every time you give them money to start a business or start doing this or start doing that, they are so wasteful. They can't manage it and they keep coming. You shouldn't help such people. You shouldn't help such people. Don't be selfless for someone who doesn't value your selflessness. Amen. <laughs> Don't help anyone who doesn't value your help. Don't help anyone who doesn't value your help. You've given them help once. You've given them help twice, and they are still coming for help. Don't help anyone who doesn't value your own selflessness. May God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit open our heart and make us to understand the meaning, the true meaning of selfless love. In Matthew chapter 7, verse 6, this is what Jesus says. Do not give what is holy to the dogs, nor cast your pearls before swine, lest they trample them under their feet and torn and tear you in pieces. Jesus is teaching you, you are not to help everybody. Open your eyes wide. Don't give what is holy to the dogs, nor cast your pearls before swine, lest they trample them under their feet and torn and tear you in pieces. That's my experience in life, you know. When you help the wrong people, people who are emotionally attached to you, people who are emotionally manipulating you, soon in life they will become your enemies. I've seen that. I've seen that. You create a problem for yourself when you are helping the wrong people. You are laying a rod for your own back when you are helping the wrong people. You are not supposed to help everyone. Not even God does that. In 2 Corinthians chapter 11, the Bible tells us about false apostles, false church leaders. Why would you be helping false apostles, false church leaders, false brothers and sisters? In, second, in, in Galatians, Chapter 2, verses 4 to 5. The Bible tells us about false brothers and false sisters. Don't help such people. Don't help them. False church members. False pastors. False ministers. Don't help them. You'll be wasting your time. You'll be responding to emotional manipulation and emotional attachment and it is not approved by God. It is not selfless love. Think about it in Matthew chapter 25, from verse 1 to 10. Jesus gives us the parable of the ten virgins. Five of them were wise, 
five of them were foolish. The five who were wise, they took their lamps and they took extra oil. The five who were foolish, they only took their lamps, but they did not take extra oil in preparation for meeting the bridegroom. In the middle of the night, there was a cry, the bridegroom is now coming. The foolish ones, their lamps had gone out and they turned to the wise ones, give us your extra oil, share your extra oil with us. Please be careful. There are people you shouldn't help. The wise virgins said to the foolish virgins, sorry, we can't share our extra oil with you. We can't help you. You go and get your own extra oil. You need a spirit of discernment when you can tell people enough is enough. Go and get your own oil. Enough is enough. Just imagine if you are carrying a pregnancy and another woman comes to you and says, let me borrow your womb. You do not tell her, can't you see that I'm using my womb to carry my own pregnancy? Be careful. It's not everybody that you must help. God does not even help everybody. So you can see in that situation, don't help false brothers, false sisters. Don't help people who are lazy, who are selfish, people who won't appreciate your help, people who are wasteful. Finally, because of time, time is far gone. Attitude number five that can promote emotional manipulation and emotional attachment. Attitude number five. When you are constantly thinking that in order to solve somebody's problems, you are the one who must do it for them, you are perpetuating poverty. You are perpetuating poverty. When you are not saying to them, go and get some training, go and learn how to manage your life, go and learn how to do things yourself, when you put yourself forward, let me go and do it for you. Let me do this one for you. You are perpetuating a mentality of dependency, a mentality of poverty. See Matthew chapter 17, verses 24 to 27. Matthew 17, verses 24 to 27. People came to Peter saying, does your master pay taxes? And Peter says, yes. When Peter got inside the house, the Lord Jesus spoke to him and said, are they asking us to pay taxes? Peter said, yes. And the Lord Jesus said, okay, go and take your fishing tackle. Go to the river, catch a fish, and then you will find money in the mouth of the fish. Now, it's possible for Peter to say, ah, you can't just send me to go and catch a fish. Give me the fishing tackle. Give me the hook. Give me the bait. No, Peter has to go and find the fishing tackle. Jesus did not give him a fishing rod. Jesus did not give him the fishing hook. Jesus did not give him the fishing bait. Peter needed to go and do that himself. Let people know what they must do for their own life. Otherwise, you are perpetuating dependency. You are perpetuating a mentality of poverty. So Peter went out, managed to find a fishing rod, the hook, the bait, and he went to the river. And he caught a fish. And in the mouth of the fish was the coin that he needed to pay his own tax and the tax of Jesus. Listen, don't perpetuate poverty. Don't perpetuate a culture of dependency. By the way you help people, you are creating problems for them, you are creating problems for yourself. It is not selfless love. Let people know 
if they need to go to school, they should go to school and get better education. If they need to get vocational qualifications, they should go and get vocational qualifications. Don't help people in such a way that you create a problem for them in their life. You are giving them fish, but they do not know how to feed. So they are going to depend upon you for feed. In the morning, they will come to you for millimage. In the afternoon, they will come to you for millimage. In the night, they will come to you for millimage because you have not shown them in the way you help that they should go and start thinking of how to manage their own life. May God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit bless us. Let's finish. In Matthew 25, verses 14 to 28, Jesus tells us the parables of the talents. So he gave talents to people. One, he gave five talents. The second person, he gave two talents. The other person, he gave one talent. He told them, go and work with the talents you have got. Everyone has got a talent that they can work with. There is no one that is born that God has not given them what they can use to benefit them in life. Point people to the talent that God has given them. Let them go and use it. Otherwise, what you'll be creating is that one person who will say, the talent that I have is not enough and they will bury it. And Jesus says to that one, take the talent away from him. Give it to the one who has 10. We need to be advising people to manage their own life. We shouldn't be helping them in a way that creates a culture of dependency, a mentality of poverty. May God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit help us. In 2 Kings chapter 4, verses 1 to 7, a widow came to Elisha saying, my husband left me in debt. What can I do? Please help me. Elisha said, what have you got? She said, I've got only one jar of oil. Everyone that comes to you, they've got one jar of oil. Show them the jar of oil. Don't create a culture of dependency. Don't create a mentality of poverty. So Elijah, Elisha said, okay, you've got one jar of oil. That's enough for you. God will help you with that one jar of oil. You know the story. The woman borrowed so many vessels and did what Elisha told her to do. She was pouring one jar of oil into all the vessels because that is what God wants to use to bless her, that one jar of oil that she didn't think anything of. When you come to the right person for advice, they will show you your one jar of oil that you should go and use and you'll be blessed. If somebody is not being blessed by their one jar of oil, you can't help them. You can't. You will only be perpetuating poverty. May God, the Father, God, the Son, God, the Holy Spirit, help us. I have to finish. A man of God called Joshua was emotionally manipulated by the Gibeonites. In Joshua chapter 9, verses 1 to 16, that you are a man of God or a woman of God, a true Christian doesn't mean you can be emotionally manipulated. But today, look at the attitudes that can make you become a victim of emotional manipulation and emotional attachment. In John chapter 6, we see the story of how Jesus fed the multitude, 5,000 people, he fed them, and when he had fed them, they felt in their heart, let us force him to become our king. Jesus knew that they thought, oh, Jesus had come just to be giving them bread every day, mealy mace in the morning, mealy mace in the afternoon, mealy mace in the night, 
That's what they were looking at Jesus for. They weren't going to work again. They wanted him to, to become their king, but Jesus refused to become king over such fools. He wasn't going to be emotionally manipulated and he wasn't going to be responding to emotional attachment. What about you? What about you? Learn not to respond to emotional manipulation. Learn not to respond to emotional attachment. Have an attitude that makes it clear to people you are not, not going to be a victim of emotional manipulation or emotional attachment. So they came to grab Jesus to make him their king, and he left them. Then they searched for him and found him. And they said, we have we've been looking for you. Jesus knew what it was all about. It was about their belly. And Jesus said to them, you are seeking me because of food. Fools, I'm not here to provide that kind of help. I've come for your salvation. I've come for your salvation. Please, whatever you do, don't set yourself on fire to keep others warm. Don't set yourself on fire to keep others warm. Be careful how you come across to people. Don't let them think that you are the answer to their problems. Point them to God. Show them the gift that God has given them in their own life that they should use to manage their own life. I'm going to go back to 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verses 4 to 8, because that's where you find the best definition of selfless love. So instead of just saying love, I will say selfless love. So 1 Corinthians chapter 13, Verses 4 to 8. Selfless love suffers long and is kind. Selfless love does not envy. Selfless love does not parade itself. Selfless love is not puffed up. Selfless love does not behave rudely. Selfless love does not seek its own. Selfless love is not provoked. Selfless love thinks no evil. Selfless love does not rejoice in iniquity, but rejoices in the truth. Selfless love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Selfless love never fails. May God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, by his gracious goodness, help us not merely to be responding to emotional manipulation and emotional attachment and thinking that we are practicing selfless love. No, when you are responding to emotional manipulation and emotional attachment, you are not practicing selfless love. Amen. We've come to the end of this broadcast. May God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit bless your understanding. I love you, but God loves you much, much more. Thank you so much for watching this broadcast. Thank you so much for listening to this broadcast. I remain your host, Pastor Dr. Kemi Atanda Ilori, the General Overseer of Living Hope Church. Bye for now. Bye.